many thanks for joining us again on the program. I am Fulashade Ogurinde. 460 duplicated projects valued at 378.9 billion naira has been uncovered in the recently signed 17.13 trillion naira 2022 budget. Yanu Fatoba, a communications associate at Budget, a civic tech non-profit organization, made a revelation in a statement. Some of the affected projects include 20.8 billion naira requested by the presidency to construct a 14-bed presidential wing at the existing State House Medical Center, uh, 28.72 million naira requested for the purchase of two units of 10 kilograms washing machine and six units of LG television in the State House Lagos Liaison Office, among others. Now, according to budgets, the infractions were discovered after examining the 21,108 capital projects in the budget. The presidency had submitted a proposed fiscal budget of 16.391 trillion naira to the National Assembly, but the lawmakers later raised it to 17.127 trillion naira, an increase of 735.8 billion naira. To discuss more on this issue, I'm joined now by Viola Kwaga, a senior research and policy analyst at Budget Nigeria. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Now, could you tell us more about um, budget discovery? Good afternoon, Fala Shade. Thank you for having me. So, uh, budget's discovery was put out in a in a release uh, we we made uh, some days ago, that sort of chronicled rather briefly our discovery of duplicated budget line items. Now, these are line items that appear in the 2022 uh, budget act. This is an act of the National Assembly that was assented to by Mr. President on the 31st of December. And sadly, uh, budget through its um, line by line analysis of over 20,000 projects discovered 460 uh, duplicated projects. Now, these projects or line items, if you will, uh, were either duplicates, that is, you would have the same line item with a different code in the same ministry, in the same MDA, or you would have a project that is beyond or not even within the scope of a particular MDA. So, you know, by and large, these are some of our most striking findings. Now, what are the economic um, implications of, of these allegations? Well, the uh, economic implications are, are staggering. Uh, I would say, first of all, it definitely means that the government, you know, through this uh, misappropriation, may likely not hit its own goals. So budgets are drafted and passed and assented to based on fiscal realities, based on expectations for revenue, based on expectations for uh, expenditure. And where there are discrepancies, where there are anomalies, you know, where there are gaps and loopholes, looking at the broader uh, macroeconomic management, uh, you would definitely see or you would definitely believe that the government would be unable to meet its own targets. And again, this has implications for national development priorities. Fortunately, uh, the president and his executive council have come up with a national development plan that spans for about five years. And we hope that uh, successive budgets will be tied to the indicators and the goals set out in this national development plan. But, you know, coming back to your question, the implications for these anomalies are, are dire because it means that the government's, you know, income tax and consumption tax targets would likely not be met. It would mean that job growth, you know, would likely not be met. And this is looking at the context of these monies that are being frittered away for political ends that could have been used for service delivery, national development ends. So it's just a simple opportunity cost assessment that one could do to see the alternative foregone, the hospitals that could have been built, the roads that could have been paved, the school teachers that could have been paid, the, the you know, maternal care that could have been given, and the infrastructure that could have been improved across the nation. Now, this is not the first time your organization will be making a discovery such as this. Uh, what loopholes do you think um, the perpetrators are exploring and what can be done uh, to curb this trend? 
So uh, it's, you know, the, the budget process is a, a very familiar one to a lot of Nigerians. There are basically four main components. Uh, one is the preparation, two is the deliberation, three is the passing, and the fourth is the implementation. You know, at every angle, there, is, there are gaps. There are gaps that exist because the political dynamics that govern government and the operation of government in Nigeria create incentives for people to exploit these loopholes. An example, I guess, could be the insertion of these uh, line items into the budget. Now, it's, it's common knowledge that the legislature is not allowed to add line items to a budget. They can only review the amounts allocated. This means that the primary responsibility of you know, the scientific research that should go into why the Ministry of Education should be given 300 million naira to renovate schools, for example, and 200 million naira to pay school teachers, for example, is done from rigorous policy analysis. And this is the job of the executive. Now, it's meant to be presented to a National Assembly that has its own internal research capacity to screen, to vet, and to robustly probe these proposals by the executive to ensure that they, that they meet, you know, at least an international standard or at least a national standard that Nigerians have agreed upon. However, uh, due to, like I said, the nature of our politics, oftentimes the, the legislature and the executives work together because it's, it's, it, logically it shows that these monies cannot have been allocated and approved and dispersed if they are not working in tandem. And I mean, if members of the civil service and members of the National Assembly are working together to see uh, these gaps exploited. Uh, going to your second question, what can be done? From the angle of civil society and, of course, the media and citizens, we do need to continually push the, the demand for better governance. This spans the entire gamut of our civic lives, from our voting choices to our conversations to you know, our engagement with our lawmakers, representatives, uh, executives, you know, and civil society as well playing its role. The various CSO actors in various uh, thematic areas from health to education to governance to transparency, all pushing for deeper engagement with government at various levels to hear what people are saying, to see what the research is saying, and to know the expectations of Nigerians. That's on one hand. You will admit that citizens and CSO uh, leaders and organizations have the power to bring people together, but they do not have the power to prescribe penalties nor to prescribe sanctions. The second leg of what can be done comes mainly from the government, and I mean the executive uh, in particular. So looking at this uh, current uh, 2020, 2022 bill, uh, act, uh, I beg your pardon, the president you know, was on record to have said he was displeased by the insertions. But surprisingly, he did not send the act back to the National Assembly. If you recall, uh, during the uh, Electoral Act issue, the president sent the act back, the Electoral Bill, uh, sorry, back to the National Assembly and refused to sign. In the case of the Petroleum Industry Act, he sent it back to the National Assembly several times. So Nigerians are perplexed as to why he would accept it this time. Could it be because there was not enough time and the December 31st window was about to close? If that is true, then why is the executive constantly submitting its proposals late? This is 2022. We've been in a, in, in a democracy for at least two decades now. It's, it stands to reason that the executive have not been able to get the proposal and preparation stage correct in order to give the National Assembly enough time to go through the budget proposal and revert to the executive who can then send it back where they have questions. These are the issues that Nigerians want to see. Uh, uh, the second portion of this second leg is for the leadership to really put a stop to the infractions. Now, there is a problem with accountability uh, in Nigeria to a large extent, where people who, you know, civil servants, political appointees that are known to have, you know, carried out these uh, actions and exploited these loopholes are never called to account. 
Yes, uh, last year the ICPC confirmed over 200 uh, duplicated items, but we never heard if anyone was arrested or sanctioned. We did not hear of any civil servants. They were suspended. So at every level, at the head of the civil service, the president himself, the minister for budget and national planning, these people in positions of leadership do need to ensure that the buck stops at their table and refuse the continuance of these uh, misappropriations and these gaps. I think these are these and a few more things are reasons or, or are ways how uh, this situation would not occur in the future. Now, now before I'd like to go, um, the report has been published. I mean, budget has done its part. Uh, of taking a closer look at uh, the 2022 budget. So the big question now is what's next? So what next really is for Nigerians to continue to press on the executive to amend these misappropriations, these clear violations of the public trust? Again, another thing that we as a country at all levels, but specifically the, the executive need to take seriously is the policy analysis and research that goes into preparation of budgets. Now, I don't just mean policy research, but even accounting principles and procedures. The recognizance of the role of audit, a, a, an issue that is talked far too little is the role of audit of government spending. And the Office of the Auditor General has made several uh, announcements. He has you know, brought these issues to the public domain I brought these issues even to the National Assembly. In some instances, mm -hmm. I, I remember recently the issue of the missing guns, the number into the thousands, you know, that were purchased and not delivered. Now, this is alarming for Nigerians. Uh, these are things that we do not wish to see uh, repeated, but we must continue to put pressure on the government, civil society organizations in particular, uh, the media playing its, its sound, critical role in national development must engage with the government at all levels, you know, to speak on these issues. And the government itself must take the responsibility, specifically looking at the leadership, in order to ensure that those who are found guilty or where there are allegations made that they are investigated and the public is carried along. Uh, lastly, I would say there needs to be more robust engagement you know, with a civil society and the citizens in budget preparation. Far too often, the public is not carried along in budget preparation. And I'm talking about, you know, the defense, uh, defense at National Assembly and the National Assembly making its findings public. So the National Assembly has several committees that sit on the various sectors as brought, brought to them by the executive. How many, uh, how much of those uh, committee uh, documents or documentations or findings are made public. So the public doesn't even know how much engagement the National Assembly has carried out on these you know, national issues that concern everyone. Uh, in summary, I will say that we all do need to put a, a lot more attention on how the government spends money, but the principal party to really make a change is the leadership uh, of the executive. Well, indeed, um, Viola Kwaga, Senior Research and Policy Analyst at Budgets Nigeria. Many thanks for your contribution on the program. Thank you for that, Shadi. Well, we'll take a break and um, the program continues shortly to stay with us. Welcome back. About a year after African countries opened their markets for business in January 2021, the Africa Export Imports Bank, Afrex Bank, in collaboration with African Union and the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFTA, has officially launched the Pan African Payment Settlement System platform for commercial use. Officials say the payments platform will simplify cross border transactions and reduce third currencies for intra African trade. But given Africa's many peculiarities, questions on acceptability have become more urgent than ever. Well, Dr. Muda Yusuf, the Chief Executive Officer, Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise, joins me now on the program. Now, what do you make of the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System? And how significant is the payments platform in facilitating the Africa free trade area? 
Well, uh, the payment system is very important uh, for the facilitation of trade, international trade. Uh, on the African continent, we have about 55 currencies. So you can imagine the complexity of trading among countries that have 55 you know, uh, currencies. So the payment system platform that is being put in place by the Afrexim Bank in collaboration with the AFCTA Secretariat, I will help to harmonize this and it will help to facilitate trade. And from the estimates that have been done, uh, the savings in terms of uh, payment transactions will be close to five billion US dollars annually. So it will, it will make the payment system much more efficient. It will make it a lot more cost effective. And therefore, you know, bring a lot of facilitation value to trade. Secondly, we don't have to now be uh, going offshore in order to perfect pay the payment systems or to perfect the international payment transactions. Because currently, you have to be de dealing with banks in US or in UK or somewhere in Europe uh, to be able to perfect transactions. But with this, I'll be able to perfect the payment system and all international payment transactions domestically. I'm talking now within the African continent, uh, which is good. It's good for pan-Africanism. It's also good for our independence, you know, as, as, as a continent. So those are the values that it will bring uh, into, into the international trading system within the context of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Now, ECOWAS has announced plans to launch its single currency by 2027. Uh, do you think this pan-African payments platform will in any way affect the takeoff of the ECOWAS single currency? No, certainly. Uh, I, I think what will happen is that the initiative by ECOWAS uh, towards a common currency, if anything, is going to complement uh, this initiative by the, by the African uh, Afrexim Bank. So they, they are complementary. Because the whole idea of a common currency in ECOWAS is also to facilitate trade, you know, to ease payment transactions and all of that. That is the whole idea. Because when you have a common currency, you save the, all, all the individual countries the challenges of having to convert before trade can take place. Just as you have in the EU. In the EU, you have the euro. And the whole idea of adopting the euro is to make trade uh, seamless, is to ease the payment system. So the same thing is going to happen. So what is happening in ECOWAS, or the proposal in ECOWAS to have a common currency is going to complement the proposal or the initiative of the Afrexim Bank. So they are all working towards towards the same goal. They are complementary. Well, let's delve deeper now. How do you see the Pan-African payment and settlement system playing out, uh, especially in terms of value and reduction of third currencies? You see, uh, the whole essence of creating this payment platform is to deal with the complexities that will arise from the relative strengths of each of those currencies. As we speak, from country to country, between each country, we have an exchange rate. For instance, between uh, Nigeria Naira and the Ghana city, there's a particular exchange rate that exists. Between Nigeria Naira and the Kenyan shillings, there's a particular exchange rate. So there is this relativity across the 54 uh, countries on the continent. So the whole essence of this platform put in place by Afrexim Bank is to e ensure that there is a proper system of harmonizing the rates and ensuring that there is smooth uh, transactions in terms of the payment system. So it is that platform that will ensure that there is fairness in the convertibility between one currency and the other. That is the whole essence of that platform. So the platform is going to deal with the challenges 
that will arise from the complexities of multiple currencies. That is the whole essence of the payment system. And in order to also help the payment system to be more efficient, all the countries need to ensure proper macroeconomic stability so that their currencies can be stable, so that it doesn't create problem for the payment system that is being put in place. Their inflation must remain low and their fiscal deficit must be kept within a prudential limit. So that will make it easy for the payment uh, system uh, platform to function efficiently. Well, it's been a little over a year since after kicked off last year. How would you rate the progress so far? Of course, progressively it will continue to get better because uh, all the political leaders and heads of states on the continent have signed on to the AFTA. Uh, they are, we are all signatories to it. But it will take some time for all the hurdles and infrastructures and all the structures that need to be put in place to be put in place. So it's going to be a progressive thing. It's going to be an incremental thing. Uh, we need to build the institutions. We need to build the systems. We need to ensure the connectivity uh, in order to, to, to be able to strengthen uh, the, 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 the trade system uh, within, within the continent. So it's going to be a gradual thing. Increasingly, I think more and more products, more and more countries will be coming on board to practically engage in trade. But no doubt it's going to be a bit slow uh, because from all indications, uh, some of the institutions are not quite ready, like the customs, the immigration officials and all of that. There are still issues around the non-tariff barriers on the continent. Uh, we are talking already about the, the issue of currency, which the Afrexim Bank is trying to support. There is the issue of connectivity in terms of transportation by road, by rail system, and by sea. All of these things need to be put in place, but it's a gradual thing. Well, Dr. Muda Yusuf, the Chief Executive Officer, Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise, thank you very much for your time. And it's a wrap on the program. See you again next time. I'm Fola Shade. Ogurinde. Bye for now.